Hello. Hello. Haha, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Somebody cared. Hello. All right, if you have any telephones, tablets, devices, whatever that, what type of electronic you have with you, laptops, desktops, whatever, would you please shut those down and put them away? We are going to worship the Lord, and he deserves our full attention. Would you, before you stick those in your pockets and your book bags, would you just double check that the sound is off, please, so that we don't have uh, a lot of interruptions during our worship time? Thank you. Put them on silent. Thank you. All right. Well, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for tonight, God. We thank you just for bringing us all into the fellowship tonight, Lord, in this middle-of-the-week service, God. Many of us are um, just needing that refresher from you, Lord. We need that refreshing touch from you tonight, Lord. We need that, that encouragement, that, that comfort, and that sustenance that only you can give. And so, Lord, as we worship you, Lord, would, all the, would you just cause all the, the baggage to fall from our backs, Lord, and from our hands and all the cares of the week, Lord, all the things that we have found frustrating or the things that we find exhausting. Lord, would you just let that fall from us so that we can stand in your presence and just worship you wholeheartedly and, um, and give you the glory that you deserve, Lord, and just be refreshed by, by our Lord and our Maker, our Creator, our God, and our King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your grace, I love your mercy. I love the way you help me when I call, and I love your truth, I love the power of your name. But you know, I love your presence most of all. Well, I love your grace, and I love your mercy. Love the way you help me when I call. And I love your truth. I love the power of your name. But you know I love your presence most of all. My soul takes refuge in the shadow of your wing. Close to you is where I want to be. Close to you is where I want to be. You are my strength, you are my God, you are my king. You are my strength, you are my God, you are my king. All I want is what you want from me. I love your grace. Well, I love your grace. I love your mercy. I love the way you help me when I call. I love the way you help me when I call. I love your truth. I love the truth. I love the power of your name. But you know I love your presence most of all. I love your grace. Well, I love your grace and I love your mercy. I love the way you help me when I call. I love the way you help me when I call. And I love the truth. I love the power of your name. There we go. You know I love your presence most of all. My soul. My soul takes refuge in the shadow of your wings. Close to you is where I want to be. You are my strength. You are my God. You are and all I want is what you want from me. Lord, we thank you for your presence tonight. God, we thank you that you're here with us. 
Lord, we love it when you're near. Because we love you, Lord. I love your grace. Well, I love your grace. I love your mercy. I love the way. you know I love your presence most of all. One more time. I love your grace. I love your grace and I love your mercy. I love the way you help me when I call. Well, I love your truth and I love the power of your name. But you know I But you know I love your presence most of all. But you know I love your presence most of all. Sometimes it feels like I'm watching from the outside. Sometimes it feels like I'm breathing. Am I alive? I won't keep searching for answers that aren't here to find. All I know is I'm not home yet. This is not where I this place is not our home. Ever since we bowed our knee to you and called you our Lord, we have no other king that we serve. And we feel it. We feel it, Lord. I feel it every day that this is not where I belong. And those frustrations start to rise. 
Lord, we feel uncomfortable here. Sometimes I don't even want to be here anymore. I want to be in your presence. But God, you've given us a commission. You've given us a purpose for our lives. You've got every one of our days numbered, and you know what you want to do with our lives. Help us to surrender to you, Lord, to be living out what you want for us every day. Not just living day to day for the, the sparkly things of this world. Lord, but be, to be surrendering on a daily basis, to be picking up our cross, to be following you, to be taking seriously the things that you've asked us to do in your name. And God, keep us uncomfortable here. Lord, if we're comfortable here, there's probably a problem. And so Lord, just help us to be effective for you. God, don't let Satan rip us off. Help us not to let Satan rip us off, Lord, as we get distracted from the things that are important and get our eyes on the things that are unimportant. God, wake us up. Don't let us be our own worst enemy. But God, make us effective, useful for you. as we open your word. God, just give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord. Don't let the things of the week get in our way and cause us to tune out, Lord, and to walk away just as empty as we walked in, Lord. But fill us up. Change us from the inside out. Use this time to grow us spiritually, grow our maturity, grow our sanctification. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, I specifically like your hoodie. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here uh, together tonight uh, to learn more about your nature and, and who you are and uh, of these kings of the past and, and uh, some lessons and things that we can take away from them, Lord. <laughs> I pray that you'll uh, give us wisdom and uh, give us things that we can use as we go back out into the world this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so I'm um, going to be covering uh, the end of 2 Kings 14 uh, to verse 7 in chapter 15 from where Rob left off last week. And um, we're going to be talking about learning from the mistakes of others. Um, I expected to go a lot further than I ended up going in, in the study. Um, and I was somewhat nervous after reading the, the chapter the first time because I thought there wasn't really much to dive into. Uh, at least like a, a topic didn't jump out at me. Um, but as per usual, his thoughts are above mine. Right. And um, so, yeah, 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 really. And um, so tonight we're going to learn about uh, a few kings of Israel and Judah. And we're going to start in 2 Kings 14, verse 23, with the reign of Jeroboam the second. Yeah, I'm not used to this mesh thing. I got like a bad angle here. In the 15th year, uh, oh, I am way down, aren't I? Oh, no, I'm right. All right. In the 15th year of Am Amaz Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. 
And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. So Jeroboam, the, the, the first, not the king that we're reading about here, uh, but the one that we're reading about's namesake, had in the past caused Israel to turn to the worship of golden calves and Baal. Um, Israel has been split into two kingdoms, so we've got Israel and Judah at this point. Uh, Jeroboam I did not want the Israelites to go to the land of Judah to worship at Solomon's temple as commanded because that could cause them to end up reuniting with the people of Judah uh, which would lead to the loss of his kingship um, so in order to put a stop to that he starts the worship of, of golden calves and Baal um, and that would keep the people of Israel divided from the people of Judah and ultimately keep him in power um, and we learn in, in verse 24 that Jeroboam the second follows down the same path and continues to have his people worship these false gods. Moving on to verse 25. Um, He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hefer. Uh, just a tiny little bit of context that is the Jonah that was in the whale so yes Um, yeah so that is him Um, for the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter and whether bond or free there was no helper for Israel and the Lord did not say that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam the son of Joash So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, what my friend David does um, and talk about Jeroboam's name and what it means. Um, His name means God increases the people. And even through his disobedience to God, we see that his name holds up. So God saw that the people were suffering and used him to restore the territory to almost what it was at the time of Solomon. Um, won't dive into Solomon here, but he conquered some land. Uh, well, David conquered some land, and then he held on to it. Um, but he restores the territory of, uh, of Israel almost back to that. Now, granted, some of that is under the kingdom of Judah, but still he pushes that border back up. But regardless of what we choose, God can still use us. Um, now, we should always strive and do our best to choose what's in line with God's will. Um, But regardless of if we're in his will or not, he can still use us to the benefit of his kingdom. Um, When I was little, my family had a garden on the hill across the yard. We had a a Granny Smith apple tree. It was like right to the left of that. And when it came time to prepare the seed, to seed the garden for the first time, um, you know, the first step there is till up the dirt, get everything loose and ready to plant it. And uh, we had this gas tiller that worked a lot like a push mower, you know, you like crank it up and whatnot. Um, and it had multiple sets of blades on the front and then rotate. And as you push, it just tills up the dirt. And dad, we did this a couple times, but dad asked me if I wanted to help him in the garden. And, so, and I'd get excited because I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do like big person work, right? You know, I'm like six or seven. And, um, you know, what, what did me helping him really look like when I was six or seven, right? It's like, he, he's certainly not letting me operate this dangerous machine with spinning blades by myself, okay. um, thankfully. Um, and even if he did, I probably wouldn't have even able to push it. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a big machine. Um, so what it looked like was Dad pushing the tiller around the garden and me standing just in front of him holding onto the bars <laughs> that were connected to the tiller. Um, so did he need my help? No, not, not at all. But he wanted me to spend time with him yeah. while he was getting things done that needed to be done. And he wanted me to learn. Learn about the profits of work and that it can be fun. Um, and in the same way, God does not need our help. Uh, but he wants us to help. He wants us to spend that time with him along the way. He wants us to be involved and learn and grow in our relationship with him. Um, unfortunately, Jeroboam did not walk with God in that way. Um, but praise God, all the resources are his, even what seems like the enemies. Um, 
my grandfather would tell me a lot of stories about how he got into trouble when he was young. And I found them amusing, sometimes cool, because, you know, you glorify things that are bad when you're little. Um, and one day, I think he kind of saw that I thought it was cool in my face um, and told me that the reason he was telling me the stuff wasn't to glorify the stuff, not to glorify the stupid stuff that he did, but to show me the mistakes that he made so that I wouldn't do the same stupid things that he did. Um, and likewise, we should learn from these kings that weren't following alongside with God and were just blundering, right? Like, where God can use us, even if we're not trying to serve him, um, we should be trying to serve him and grow closer to him in, in experiences. Um, so anyway, God stands by his promise. Uh, he did not say that Israel would be blotted out, uh, quite the contrary. And uh, he ends up using Jeroboam II uh, to the end of preventing that from happening. Verse 28. Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and, and all that he did, his might, how he made war, and how he recaptured for Israel from Damascus and Hamath, what had belonged to Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? So Jeroboam rested with his fathers, the kings of Israel. Then Zechariah, his son, reigned in his place. So a little more context around the, the land Jeroboam II captured. There should be a map. Yeah, cool. Um, he was able, so here we have Solomon's empire. So I wanted to give you a little comparison here. Uh, but on the left is Solomon's empire. And on the right, we can see what Jeroboam was able to expand it to. Um, and so you can see the bottom part in the pink is Judah. Uh, I should not have covered up the other picture. <laughs> there are two pictures under that um, because it has what it looked like when he became king. But right down to the first, like right in the middle above Israel, where there's a bolded word there. Uh, that was basically the border. Of, of what was Israel. So, like, doubled the size of Israel. Um, so, speaking of Judah uh, at this point, let's move on to, we're going to bounce around a little bit here. So we're going to be in Second Chronicles chapter 26, and we're going to learn about Azariah, also known as Uzziah. Uh, but you might want to bookmark Second Kings chapter 15 because we're going to jump back to it. So kind of kind of bounce back and forth a little bit here. So Second Chronicles chapter 26, starting in verse one. Now all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Elath and restored it to Judah after the king rested with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His, mother, his mother's name Jechaliah of Jerusalem. Man, 16. I was in like six car accidents <laughs> in like a few months after I turned 16. I can't imagine if I had been handed a kingdom. Um, anyway, verse 4. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, or Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Now he went out and made war against the Philistines and broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabna, and the wall of Ashdod. And he built cities around Ashdod and among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians who lived in Ger, Baal, and against Meunites. Also, the Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah. His fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. And Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and the valley gate, and at the corner buttresses of the wall, he, then he fortified them. He also built towers in the desert, he dug many wells, for he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plains. He also had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved the soil. Moreover, 
Uzziah had an army of fighting men who went out to war by companies, according to the number on their roll, as prepared by Jaliel, the scribe, and Messiah. Messiah. I'm going to give up on that word. (laughs) The officer under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains, the total number of chief officers of the mighty men of valor was 2,600. And under their authority was an army of 307,500 that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. Then Uzziah prepared for them for the entire army shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and slings to cast stones and made devices in Jerusalem invented by skillful men to be on the towers and corners to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread far and wide, for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. We learn a lot of the stuff that he did right, um, that Azariah did or Uzziah did right. He followed in the footsteps of the Lord, and the Lord made him prosper because of it. God gave him a lot of tactical wisdom for war. He, built, he rebuilt Jerusalem's walls and built up towers at the gates. Uh, Under him, ballistas were invented and mounted on the corners of Jerusalem, like massive crossbows that, you know, like you're shooting like a log instead of an arrow, right? Like, um, and God also gave him wisdom to build up the land. He built towers and dug wells in the desert to hold all the blessings that God poured out on him. Livestock, farmers, vine dressers. God blessed him with massive armies. He had 2,600 chief officers of the mighty men of valor. I don't know if we remember what David's mighty men did, but one of them killed 300 guys with a spear by himself. (laughs) Another of them killed a lion in a pit in the snow. Well, Azariah has 2,600 chief officers over his mighty men. Um, And so he was famed by neighboring kingdoms. It says that Egypt famed him. But that fame starts to go to his head. Um, So we're going to read the 2 Kings chapter 15 account, which is just verses 1 through 7, and then we'll bounce right back to uh, Chronicles 26 to get more detail about it because the the version in chapter 15 really glosses over. uh, It's like like spark notes. So... um, 2 Kings chapter 15, uh, verse 1. In the twenty-seventh year of Jeroboam, the king of Israel, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, became king. He was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, except that he had high except that the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Then the Lord struck the king, so that he was a leper until the day of his death. So he dwelt in an isolated house, and Jotham, the king's son, was over the royal house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of Chronicles, the kings of Judah? So Azariah rested with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David. Then Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. Well, they are, in fact, written in the book of Chronicles, and that's why we're going to jump back there. Uh, But we learn that people are still sacrificing burnt incense on the high places, and because of this, the Lord struck him with leprosy. But that's not everything that happened. So let's flip back to (laughs) 2 Chronicles 26. We're going to start in verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So yeah, the people did it, but, you know, he did too. So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord. 
So we know from Proverbs 16, uh, verse 18, and probably from hearing it our entire life, <laughs> that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit uh, before a fall. We often shorten that to pride comes before a fall. Um, well, the word of the Lord is never wrong. And Azariah's pride came before his destruction. So let's hear about what happened. Verse 19. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord beside this incense altar. And Azariah, the chief of priests, and all the priests looked up at him, or looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous, so they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried out because the Lord had struck him. So Second Kings tells us that people were burning incense on the altar, but we learn that Azariah himself did it too. Now, to the priest credit, especially Azariah the priest, which uh, maybe is why they call him Uzziah here uh, and through this whole chapter, but um, they stood up to him. They kicked him out. Symbolically and literally, he was removed from God through his disobedience. Um, but he's not only disobedient. When he's confronted about his disobedience, he doubles down on it. And that disobedience turns to his anger. Uh, pride is, is a difficult thing. It's, it's easy to fall into the lies that it feeds you. Um, in my late teens and early 20s, I went through a period that it definitely got the best of me. Um, I related my success with everything that I was doing at the time. I was working in the day and going to college at night. God had given me a great starting job uh, at Delta, and it was like kickstarting my career really quickly. Uh, and at the same time, I was getting school knocked out. Um, Delta was flexible, and they were allowing me to do some of the classes, like even at lunch and stuff like that. So. Um, work extra I'd like work extra at the end of the day um, but God put a bunch of people in my path that gave me opportunities that were way far beyond anything I deserved um, but I was full of myself thinking that oh I made all these decisions and because I made these decisions and worked that's where I was where I was and I even like I flat out told people that like I, I thought it and I said it um, I would talk through the reasons I thought, like, hey, I'm successful. This is why. You should do what I do. Um, and I enjoyed debating a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was very stubborn. I ended up debating a lot of people on my college campus. Um, politics and just all kinds of stuff. I enjoyed it. Um, but I bragged on myself a lot during that time. And when I look back on that period of time in my life, it, frankly, it's embarrassing to me. Um, I don't like who I was during that time, uh, and the advantage of hindsight, uh, you know, and all that it is, um, I'm really thankful that I grew closer to God, and then he showed me, <laughs> he showed me that it was not me, um, but between then and now, he has shown me exactly how he provided for me the entire time, every opportunity, every person that was put in my path, uh, even giving me the uh, ability to keep up with everything that was happening. I was just along for the ride. And uh, thankfully, he taught me that through many smaller lessons over that period of time and not leprosy on my head. So, <laughs> um, but that pride that I had, I've kind of watched, I still struggle with it some, but I've, I watched it slowly turn into reliance mm -hmm. and on where my help really comes from, Jesus. Um, and so I'm really grateful for that time, but I, I totally get where he's falling, right? He's 16. He's put over the, this empire, basically. He's got th an army of 300,000 people. God's making him successful in everything he does because he's following God. It's not because of what he's doing. Um, and the land is prospering. You've got other large, like, very stationed countries that are like, wow, look at that guy. You know, that goes to your head quickly. Yeah. Um, in verse 21, King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. 
Then Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, from the first to the last, the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, wrote, So Uzziah rested with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of burial which belonged to the kings, for they said, He is a leper. Then Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. So I think the, the lessons that we can learn from Azariah here are twofold. One, pride is extremely dangerous. Uh, being full of ourselves is really easy, especially in a world that's telling you to follow your heart and your feelings. Um, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's Jeremiah 17, 9. Um, we're not to follow our heart. We're to follow Christ Amen. and his example. Um, God has given us a guidebook for our time here, and it would do us well to follow his instructions in it. Um, we can't take pride lightly. We should check ourselves for it and humble ourselves. The second is not to fall into the trap of doubling down on our own sin. And that's another thing that pride's going to want you to keep doing. You're not going to want to admit that you're wrong or that there's error in your ways. I know it did that to me. <clears throat> but admitting when we're wrong and repenting and turning from those wrong ways to Christ is how we develop and get better. Um, so I encourage you not to dig in uh, and learn from our and others' others errors as we help God till his garden um, and with that I'll open to any questions comments insights I, do. I wanted some clarification so Uzziah is the same as King Azariah is that correct yes and then it also just happens to be that the priest that went his in name after is also him Azariah. is also yes. Azariah yes. okay got yeah. it um, but yeah if you you look same mom name same uh, king that they hail from, both of the names, they both got leprosy. They both started reigning when they were 16, and they both reigned for the same period of time. Okay. So it's, it's the same dude. And Jotham is the son. And Jotham is the son in both cases. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I, I thought maybe they wanted to like keep the priest's name as Azariah because he did the right thing. So they were like, all right, well, in this recount, you get Uzziah. <laughs> but I'm not sure. I, I couldn't find on why the, the name was different. Because it's Uzziah. You messed up. <laughs> I don't know. There you go. Yeah. I thought it was really awesome, too, about that, like, with leprosy being a symbol of sin, how God was almost like, well, if you're going to have it in your heart, you might as well have it on your face. Yeah. You know, like that external display of what was going internally with his pride and mm -hmm. and his rebelliousness and, and, his sure that, and his refusal to submit to correction. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm sure that got to here, hopefully. Hopefully. Right? Like, if you're going to look like what you are, then... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's that blatant public display against authority. It's the same thing that Urim did against Moses. Yeah. And why she got leprosy also because it was a deliberate public. He did it publicly, yeah. blatantly against against God. But one thing you do see with both of them is that uh, God does show mercy because He could have just struck the dead. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because when it, when Aaron's son had given their sacrifice incorrectly, God struck them dead right, immediately. Right. There was no. Anything just right. dead. And when Cora <laughs> rebelled, when Cora rebelled Nobody, publicly, Brown swallowed him up. Yep, and yeah. not just to you. Right. So yeah. what I see in there is, while it's a, we look at that as a very strict punishment, it is a type of kindness and a type of mercy because, okay, I'm going to strike you with leprosy. I'm going to see if you'll humble yourself yeah. as a result of this. Or are you going to turn back? Because right. God could have just struck him dead immediately. Right. It would have had every right to do so. Right. Right. That's a good point. I would like <coughs> to share this. I thank God for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we got back there. And we ain't got to go through that with the Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> with the leprosy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, and no Holy Spirit. I mean, it's hard enough for me to identify when pride is creeping out or creeping, you know, creeping in with the Holy Spirit yeah. dwelling in me. It must be impossible without it. 
without without him. But there have been stories in the New Testament where he struck people down dead. Mm-hmm. Yes. Or yeah. oh, I did this, and then. Um, oh, did you? Yeah, and then <laughs> a pastor's wife uh, had told us that in their church, this guy stood up and he said, "I'm the one that put up these walls. See my name?" And then he fell down dead. Hmm. Yeah. So, there just saying that pride can even get you dead today. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, it can. Mom is a pastor. Yeah. I remember that verse. Um, yeah. The verse you were preaching. Yeah. I remember this. And um, you can't do nothing wrong. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. You just have you to. Gotta have him. You gotta serve him. And you gotta be it's humble. No way to go. <laughs> yeah. Accept that correction and, and right. be willing to, to learn humility. I think we've actually done that uh, verse a disservice with that. We made it prime that comes before a fall. Right, but it's But it bigger comes from before that. destruction. Right, uh, destruction. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. For sure. And sometimes, like, I mean, I, t- I think we tend to think self-destruction, but we know that sin has multiple um you know, mass casualties, depending on what the sin is. There can be, and there can be generations of casualties, depending on the sin as well. Sure. Hmm. Good lesson. This sin there in the temple was the same sin that he led the other people in following him. Mm -hmm. And that's the other issue, is when you're that high of a public figure, Mm -hmm. when you sin, you leave everybody else along with you. Right. And that's why it's so much more dangerous and so much more detrimental and why God has to deal with it immediately. Right. Because he has to keep his authority with people. Look, right. I am going to be respected. You're going to honor me even if your leader doesn't. Right, right. And you could see that he was already willing to tolerate sin by leaving the high places up. You know, he could have had those dismantled. didn't. So he was already ready to tolerate it. The, the same same thing all the way down. I did the funny like thousands of years same story. The original sin and it's yeah. just like still here, still creeping. Yeah. Let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for uh, for again for bringing us here tonight safely. I pray that you'll help us all get home safely. Um, I pray that you'll uh, help us focus our our mind and hearts on you, um, and to be about your business as we go back into the world, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
me discouraged tonight. Anyone else need that overflow? Anyone else need that filling? Anyone else had enough? Anyone else frustrated? Because I am. spirit is so exhausted some days. 
wanting so much more for the Lord. I want so much more for the Lord. He's so good and he's so faithful. And he's so generous. And my heart just breaks. At the garbage we give him. struggle. And this, this song is such a prayer for me. I mean, I know it's supposed to be a worship song, but it's just, a, it's a prayer for me because there's days I just feel so empty. I just want him to move. I just want him to move. I just want him to do something miraculous. I don't even really know what I'm asking for. but I know my cup is empty. And if yours is too, you can sing this last verse with me. Lord, my cup is empty. Lord, my cup is empty. Fill me with your spirit to overflow, to overflow. Lord, my cup is empty. Lord, my Fill me with your spirit to overflow, to overflow. we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more
Lord, as we go out into our week, just show us where our pride is. Show us where our, where our areas, Lord, that still need to be surrendered to you, that still need, that still need to be turned over to you, Lord. God, give us hearts that receive correction. And if we have to be the ones to give correction, give us hearts that can give correction and and justice, uh, but also in mercy, Lord. Only you know where that line is. And so, God, there's times where we have to correct a brother or a sister or a kid or or whatever, and it's it's difficult to do, Lord. And so, God, just uh, do heart surgery on us however you see fit, Lord. We don't even know our own hearts. Paul says, I don't even know my own hearts. How can I judge someone else's? I can't even understand my own. And so, Lord, you know our hearts, and uh, I pray that you would do that heart surgery, that you would, that you would make that change. In Jesus' name, amen.